nuestro último día de la conferencia y es realmente un placer para mí presentar al doctor Lucky J. Y MBA, miembro de la Junta de Actividad de la Red de Niños, oficial de pediatría. Y disculpen, tenemos un problema con el sonido. Thank you, Nigela. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. So it's really a, a pleasure to be with you again this morning. Uh, we've had such wonderful three days in large part because of um, uh, Najla's uh, local hospitality, but all of you who uh, are part of this organization. My task today is a special chart that I, I feel very, very passionate about. I'm going to talk to you about work-life balance, burnout, and the winding road to professional happiness. I think this is, at the end of the day, Recording in progress. No matter what we do, if we're not happy, then we have to ask, why? What is it for that we, you know, we buy fancy cars or we, you know, do everything that we do for our family, for our children, but if at the end of the day, it doesn't create durable happiness, then regardless of whether that unhappiness originates deep inside us or from the environment around us, we need to figure that out. And I'll share with you some, some personal thoughts about, about this. Um, so, I would love for this to be a little interactive. I know it, we only have half an hour. I normally, I can do this for two hours and still not have enough time because it's really such an important topic. But I would like you to um, participate in this exercise with me. And so I'm going to ask you four questions, Quattro, only four questions. The first question is what I do in my job is it joyful or not, okay? What do you do in your job? Is it joyful? Okay, yes. all right, so hang on to that thought, all right. Do you have the right skill set to do your job? I believe yes. Yes. No. Yes, yeah, the answer should be yes. I mean, you're an, you're an international expert in kangaroo care and you, you're very passionate about what you do. You've studied it, you're considered an authority. Yes, you have the right skill set. What you do, what you do in Calgary to take care of your patients, is it meaningful? Yes, <laughs> yes. And what you do in your job, impacting lives, is it meaningful? Yes, yes, yeah. You know, I always think about people who make these mm, scam calls, you know, um, calls to sell you fraudulent things, you know, life insurance or car insurance or try to get your information. They also have a job. And I ask myself, at the end of the day, they must feel miserable having cheated people to make a living. And if it, it, it does it matter? Is it meaningful? Yes, what you do 
is very meaningful. And then the final question is, are you resilient? Nigela, when real stress occurs, will you bend or will you break? That's a question that, that we, will need to, we will need to answer because it's not an easy question to answer. You can, you can reflexly say one thing or the other, but really at the end of the day, we have to be honest with ourselves because we don't know. We really don't know because many of us have not faced the type of hardships that slaves faced in this very island centuries ago. We're, we're living comfortable lives in air conditioned places. We went to the cave where the slaves were burned down. I mean, that's, that's the type of stress that I'm talking about. Um, are, we, are we prepared strong enough to, to, to deal with that or not? So let's try to answer these questions. Every day in healthcare, you'll see new challenges. This virus has shaken us up. 604 million cases worldwide. In the US alone, close to 100 million cases. Lots of frontline people, nurses, physicians who have died. There's a lot of burnout from the long haul syndrome because it doesn't seem to be ending. You know, you want it to be gone like H1N1, like the swine flu, like Ebola, whatever it is. You want it to be gone, but it's still here. And so one has to think about this post-traumatic stress disorder that we are all feeling, the desire to protect your six-year-old. Every time you get exposed to an infected patient in the hospital, even though you have a mask on, you worry. You know, my wife is an emergency room physician. And when everyone, when the whole place uh, had shut down, um, she went to work every day, taking care of patients. And then she would come back to our home, to our grandchild who had come with our daughter to come be with us because New York had completely shut down. And she would, quietly go down to the basement of the house, bathe, you know, put the clothes in the, in the um, washing machine, in the um, uh, clothes washer before she would come back up because she was so worried, not about herself, but she was worried about protecting her family. And we've witnessed untold misery, uncertainty of the disease, we have staffing challenges, six people, six pediatricians covering the entire island over here. And there is no end in sight. And so let me ask you now, all of you, and I hope all of you on the, in the Zoom uh, call do the same wherever you're sitting. I'm asking you to raise your hand if you think what you do in your professional life is joyful. Is it joyful? Joyful. Yeah, all right, no, 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 don't, don't put your hand down. Okay, is it joyful? Yes, okay. Now, um, you can put your hand down actually. And let me, ask, let me ask you to answer these following questions. Do you feel exhausted, tired, and physically run down. Yes, right? Yeah. I do. I mean, my work day, every day, is a 12-hour work day, every day. I, Saturdays, Sundays included. Um, I have multiple jobs right now. And, you know, my children often ask me, Dad, you're, you're 65, aren't you? going to slow down at some point. And my answer to them is that, you know, there is no choice. I don't feel I have that choice right now. And I don't feel I have that much control in what, in what I do, uh, but I do feel exhausted, tired and physically run down 
um, sometimes I do feel irritated towards my coworkers, right? You do too, right? Yeah, because you're pulling your weight. You're doing everything that you possibly can and somebody else is not. That bothers you, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we feel cynical towards work because we feel the institution that we work for is not helping us, not giving us the support we need, yeah? And there is a sense of being overwhelmed. Sometimes we lose our temper. We, we press on the brakes and we slam, we press on the horn when somebody, a driver who's probably not even intentionally doing something comes in front of us, you know, and just shows to, goes to show that we are at the edge of our temper. Sometimes we have difficulty sleeping. We experience difficulty thinking logically and making decisions because we are, we are always juggling multiple things, all right? It's, and I, if I feel overwhelmed sometimes, I applaud every mother in this room, every sister in this room, because I saw my mother growing up, stitching clothes to make sure that we had good education. And Behind the scenes, she kept the entire household together. And so all, for all of you who are in professional careers, but also are mothers and daughters and wives, you are um, juggling a lot more than, than many others. And that creates this strange environment where you're unable to relax and concentrate, whether it's at home or at work. And so for every one of you who said it is joyful, what you have actually now told me is that it's joyful, but, but all of this is also true. And this is all from this Maslex burnout inventory, which says if you check even two boxes here, you have signs of burnout. But it is true, it is true. It is true that we are all experiencing signs of burnout, but you're not alone. One in two healthcare workers worldwide are experiencing this, experiencing this. Now there was a time when maybe it still happens in the, in the island if I was a physician and I walked into a grocery store, people would move out of the line because 40 years ago, the respect for doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals was at a different level. Today, it's all crappy corporate stuff. I swear to you, it bothers me a lot that the respect that people had for healthcare, people is gone. And that, that leads to this trauma that we all feel collectively, right? How dare somebody shout at me when I'm trying to provide the best possible care to the family or to the patient or to the child? That, that's moral injury. And and so I, I do think that these are, are little things that have stolen the joy out of practice. And I wish I knew a simple way to restore it, but I think collectively, we as a healthcare profession have to own that. We've got to figure out a way to restore the respect and the, the joy in, in our practice. And for those of you who don't um, necessarily agree, although I, I see from the way you're shaking your heads that all of you agree, we have the highest rate of depression of any profession out there. Healthcare people. 
and we don't diagnose our depression. We don't, we don't talk about it because we're supposed to be macho people, right? We're supposed to help other people. We don't talk about our own sadness, right? Do you? Do we? We don't. We don't. We, we don't even talk to our own selves about it because we are such so defensive in our approach to these things. And so a lot of people abuse, um, uh, experience alcohol and substance abuse. And look at the suicide rate over here. Unbelievable. And who talks about it? Do, does the healthcare profession talk about it? No. We just, we just are asked to keep doing more and more. And so at some point, we hit the bottom and we lose meaning. There's emotional exhaustion. I don't care about physical exhaustion. You know, I run, I play tennis. Um, I go to the gym to be physically exhausted, right? That's okay. But mental and emotional exhaustion, that's hard. That's really hard because that then goes around my circle. My family picks it up. My friends pick it up. They say, what's wrong with you, Lucky? Um, are you not feeling good? Well, I mean, it is at some point that emotional exhaustion uh, hits you. And the, the thing is that we all think of only one marriage in, in our lives, the traditional sort of uh, marriage to our families where we have our children, parents, siblings, extended family. We now have this very, very demanding second marriage to our work, patient care, whatever you do. The marriage that we have completely forgotten is the marriage to our own selves, right? We've got a responsibility for our own selves, because if we don't take care of ourselves, and if we're not strong enough to take care of our own selves, how can we be strong enough to take care of others, right? And so it's really important that we pay attention to our own health, our spirituality, to our community of people around us, that we relax when we need to relax. And there are times when we just need to be silent, and that's okay. It's okay to be just quiet sometimes, you know, sit in the porch or feel the breeze coming and, and just touching your face and just, just observe things. But today's world requires us to constantly be on the phone, looking at social media posts or looking at television news uh, things about a murder here and a rape there and, you know, atrocities still happening. And we're living in this century where Things were supposed to change. Slavery should have been long gone. And yet there is human trafficking happening. There are all types of ills of the society that we continue to you know, shrug our shoulders. We say, I, I don't know what to do about it. And there's also this truth <clears throat> that money cannot buy happiness. It simply cannot. Yeah. Now, it is true, having come from a very um, middle class background in India, where my mother and father raised four children in, with a very modest income, I understand having grown up that way. I mean, throughout my high school and early college education, I taught. I, I taught younger kids to be able to earn enough money to be able to help um, pay for things that you know my parents couldn't afford to. And then I, once I um, graduated from, from college, I started applying to every organization I knew in the world, hoping that I would get an opportunity uh, to train um, to do more advanced training. But that's how we all did. We, 
we didn't understand then the concept that money, what, how critical money is. Money is critical until a certain point. But once basic needs are met, beyond that, adding heaping heaps of money over that doesn't, doesn't buy happiness. And that's why I now have a, uh, in my department, I mean, that's why when I spoke with Nigela the other day and she said there are only six pediatricians, in my department, um, we now have, in, just in my department, we have 700 subspecialists. 700 subspecialists. In my oncology, pediatric oncology, hematology division, we have 120 doctors. Now, not trainees, not, these are, these are full, fully trained people. So it's a, it's a very large system. And I talk to every one of them saying, you know, whenever you need me, I'm there for you. You talk to me and tell me what is the right size job for you. And we will figure it out. But at the end of the day, I want you to be happy. I want this to be a meaningful job for you. And so it's really important that we right size our job and we don't sit here at the edge constantly worrying when am I just going to drop off? I'm sorry, did you, did you take that picture? Okay, <laughs> but please, you know, um, I, I told Nigela that these slides um, she's gonna send out to all of you. So yeah, so you, uh, but do, do take pictures, but yeah, I want you to have these slides so you can think about it. You can talk to your families and you can talk to your coworkers about it because this is information that I feel everyone should have at their fingertips, right? And so the second question is an easy one. Do you have the right skill set? I think um, you, <clears throat> you all have the right skills. The bigger question is, um, how do we continue to polish them, right? And this is a, a quick story about a woodcutter who cut the best possible wood. And then one day he goes to his, his manager and says, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm working harder than ever before. I can't cut good wood anymore. And I used to love this job. I'm not loving the job anymore. Guess what the manager says to him? When was the last time you sharpened your ax? Because so many times a decade goes by and we've not really figured out what how to sharpen that X, how to make that, um, uh, that skill set better so that we take pride in our work. We just continue to do what we've been doing, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so it's really important that we continue to sharpen our skill set. And that means that we get smarter uh, at everything that is assigned to us. We do it more efficiently. That creates more time. I know of people in our system who at midnight are still signing charts. They're, you know, and I'm wondering why? Why, why Luis, are there people who are still working at midnight? Two o'clock, they'll wake up and you see them in the electronic medical record that they've signed in. And they're just not signed in and gone to sleep. You actually see them working. And so we got to get more efficient. We've got to have a business savvy approach to our own work. That is me. I need to become more efficient. And then I don't want to spend too much more time on this. The fact we've all agreed to is that what we do is very meaningful. What you do is very, very meaningful. And I hope that at the end of the day, when you see, feel down, when you feel sad, you keep that in your mind that um, we were brought to this profession not by chance, that this, there's the good Lord, whoever you believe in, um, put us in this to, to do good, to be good, and, and to be able to impact 
uh, other lives. And we, we just need to feel thankful and grateful uh, for that opportunity. And uh, Nigel, I, I found this picture of your, your hospital on, on the website. These, are, these babies are not from your hospital, but I do know that what you all do uh, in your space is, is so meaningful. And so the final question is, are you resilient? And I think that that is a very difficult question to answer because we don't know until the real storm comes. And that's when we will discover if we bend or we snap and break. And there are examples everywhere where people will tell you that I had no idea that the per that person, um, she was also always so happy and positive until something happened and like that, snapped. And so we really need to make sure that we, to create resilience, we say physically energized. Um, we stay emotionally connected with our own selves and we are purposefully aligned with everything that we do. And these are important concepts to understand because we have, most of us, a very superficial understanding of these things. We kind of think we know that, what we're talking about, but we're not sure. And that alignment is with our inner core. If what we do is not aligned with what we internally believe in, there will be a conflict. Uh, Dr. Kessler and I were talking about the political, um, um, political chaos that's in every part of the world today, you know, you look at these politicians standing in front of the microphone saying one thing and you know that that SOB doesn't mean a word of what, what he said. That's not purposeful alignment. That is thuggery, that is cheating. That is worse than breaking into somebody's home to make um, people believe in something that is not true, but, but that's the way systems work. And so it requires us to look inwards and make sure that there is a spiritual, mental, emotional and physical connection to everything that we do. And we reestablish the physical engagement. And that means that we create this homeostasis in our system. Now, homeostasis in the system requires this balance between the autonomic nervous system, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. You know, we're programmed. Uh, if our great great grandparents were slaves, we're always still going to have that epigenetic phenomenon where every loud noise scares us. And we run, we, our heart rate runs. And we, we are always in the fright mode because there is structural racism in every sphere of life. And whether it is, you know, how we treat each other, if we're not honest about it, we, we will always um, uh, fail to make changes, but there is, um, a huge amount of um, inequity that drives us constantly into the sympathetic overdrive, which we need to be careful about. And emotionally connected, I've already spoken to, the easy emotions are fear, worry, frustration, uncertainty, and grief. Can you remember that? Those are the easy emotions. Our body normally, because survival is important, we always migrate to fear, worry, frustration, uncertainty, and grief. The balancing emotion is really joy and happiness. And that doesn't come naturally because that is not survival. If, you, if a lion or a tiger or a fire is burning and coming towards you and you're sitting there happy, joyful, that's not, that's not gonna help. You got to have the right 
sympathetic drive at that time to, to survive. But other times, it is important to really focus on this and your resting heart rate will tell you the story. And purposefully aligned, I think that is where unlimited energy lives. Uh, it's very important to get connected back to our core uh, and make sure that we are living a purposeful life. Um, in our classic training, we teach people to do stuff. We don't teach them to live the life. We, we teach people to become good IV, people to start good IVs or to take good nursing care. We don't teach people to become good fulfilled nurses or good fulfilled doctors. And then every now and then when mistakes happen, you know, we, we feel guilty. This is from the Olympics. These are two US teams. And in both cases, you, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but this baton over here in this person's hand, um, this person's hand is way out there. He's trying to grab it and the baton drops. Same thing over here. And Tyson Gay said, I'm a veteran. I have never dropped a baton in my life. I felt it right there near my thumb area. When I went to grab it, nothing. I should have made sure. I guess it was my fault. And so that happens a lot. That is becoming a second victim. And then we keep thinking about it. We keep thinking about it because our mind keeps on telling that story. And that story, this particular nurse from Seattle area, she was one of the strongest nurses in that hospital system. She made one mistake. Instead of giving um, X amount of calcium that was ordered into the ECMO circuit, she took 1000 milligrams by mistake of calcium and injected it into the circuit. And the baby arrested and died. Two weeks later, they discovered her body in her apartment. You know, I mean, she had become a second victim, but nobody recognized it. And it's really that uh, consequence of second victim syndrome that we need to be careful about. And we are um, trying our best to make sure that in this winding road of professional happiness, we continue to take care of this, this happiness pie. We, I don't um, spend too much time thinking whether it's genetic life circumstances or intentional activities. Most people think that uh, it's life circumstances, but really think about this. Life circumstances are a very small piece of total happiness that we got to make sure that this genotype and phenotype that we manage, we, we continue to focus on creating a durable happiness out of this. And so if and when we do collapse, remember that road to recovery is slow and bumpy, that life has its own ways of putting us back on track. It's not easy, but you will get back on track. There are always opportunities and commitment to the cause uh, and our own wellness is, is key to that. Um, and you'll know where your friends are, where your real well-wishers are, because they will come around you. They will help you down this winding road. Because those are the people who, now that I have also myself gone through, these ups and downs, I know who my real friends are because they were there for me at that darkest hour. And now I feel it's my responsibility to be there for them if they ever need me. And that creates this internal feeling of always wanting to be kind. Kind, no matter what color you are, what race you are, what profession you are, it doesn't matter. Are we kind to each other? Do we promote a fair and just culture? Do we practice random acts of kindness? 
because ultimately our winding roads to professional happiness are all interlinked. No two stories are too different. And we must heal the healer first because you need to be strong enough to, to care. So with that, my, my best wishes to you in your journey. Stay healthy, stay strong, because the future of medicine is in your hands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. Amazing presentation. I believe that totally.